First, uh, thank you for your business. We wouldn't exist without you guys. And uh, if um, you know, I'd love to get feedback from you on what we could be doing better in one of the breaks. So thanks for using it. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So um, as I said earlier, I, I mean, I'm part of AWS. I run database engines, which is at this point um, uh, Redshift, which is uh, our scale-out managed data warehousing infrastructure, Aurora, which is a MySQL compatible enterprise-grade uh, um, OLTP uh, database, and um, EMR, which is our managed Hadoop system environment. Um, so when uh, my buddies at Informatica asked me to talk here, what they asked me to cover was basically uh, provide some thought leadership around the future of analytics. Now, that's actually something of a stretch assignment for me because I spend most of my days looking at stack traces as a kernel developer. But, uh, you know, <laughs> see how it goes. I know that you guys probably uh, know more about the topic than I do, but uh, we'll uh, do what we can. Maybe as I start out, I'll just talk about some stuff that should be relatively non-controversial and obvious, and then maybe I'll move over to some anecdotes about things that uh, I've heard from other customers in the past. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess uh, one of the interesting things about what Ash was saying earlier is, is that uh, what we're seeing nowadays is very similar to what we saw in the past. I mean, in the past, maybe, you know, 25 years ago, you were building an application, you started with a database, the data sets were small, systems could come up, come together, you ran, uh, you know, transactions and reporting on the same system, life was uh, easy and good. You move along. Oops, sorry. Uh, you, the data sets get larger, the systems get slower, life can start to get better. Um, you decide to build a data warehouse, right? Uh, we've all done that, um, and you, know, you can scale for a long time. The data is unified. There are lots of things that are work now as well. You fast forward to the current statement, and then again, as Ash was saying, that's a lot better than building or running these apps yourselves, right? Someone else is doing all the undifferentiated heavy lifting for you, but you're back to silos. The reports that run are running against these individual data sets, and that's just not good enough. And so you're back to the same problem we were all back, at, you know, we were all running, you know, struggling with 25 years ago. You know, sort of the effective progress, I suppose. Um, and your question is to pan multiple uh, systems, right? Uh, so here are a handful of things. You know, I find it one of the things that I look for when I'm starting to look at sort of what the future is is I look at the consumer space, you know, systems like ad tech and so forth, where they intrinsically have to merge data from multiple places. So if I look at a customer uh, like uh, Hearst, you know, they use Google Analytics, they use Omniture, they use Mixpanel and Kissmetrics. They also happen to have a website. And uh, you know, they ha also happen to have clickstream data. And so when they're trying to figure out whether their campaigns are working, they need to bring all of that data together, right? And so, and that problem, um, replicates itself across pretty much any customer who has a SaaS application because it's rare that the data can reside in only a single place. So, you know, basically similar picture to the one Ash just was describing earlier, you know, uh, bring your data together, put it in a central data warehouse, probably in the cloud, run your reports off of it. You know, it looks clean, right? Um, quick pitch for Redshift. Um, along the way, you know, uh, Redshift's pretty awesome, pretty cheap, pretty fast. I'll keep moving. Um, <laughs> you know, there's uh, AWS is also pretty awesome. A uh, lot of uh, you know, we really believe in uh, a notion of one size does not fit all. You can match the pieces you need. You can build the other pieces that you want to build yourselves that are make sense for you. And what that really does is remove the uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting for you. Um, you know, yeah, so I'm done pitching you guys. Um, but all told, this is a lot of effort. And you know, whenever something's a lot of effort, it raises that baseline question of why bother, right? Is it worth it? So uh, let's, this is sort of the segue into the future of analytics, if you will. Um, so, you know, why are we analyzing stuff? Well, the obvious reason is to run reports, right? I'm not going to tell you guys that reporting is useful. You all know reporting is useful. 
we all run reports, right? Um, you know, all of the standard things, single version of truth, measure what you manage, et cetera. Uh, my view is, is that this is not so interesting. This is what everyone, but unfortunately, this is where everyone stops. So let's go into some anecdotes. So reporting helps you understand what happened, the transactions that have occurred. What's a whole lot more interesting is why. And more importantly, why not? So here's an example. So inside AWS, uh, a sister organization of mine, uh, Relational Database Services, lets you buy um, uh, managed database services from people like Oracle, SQL Server, uh, Postgres, MySQL. And uh, so you know, we offer um, RDS uh, SQL Server. As it turns out, uh, EC2 also lets you get an AMI where you can get SQL Server. Uh, not managed, you manage it yourself. Uh, but you know, so the question for me, let's say, as a product manager for RDS SQL Server is, why did someone not choose that versus EC2, right? Was it because they didn't know RDS existed? Was it they stopped on a clickstream page when they looked at the pricing page? Was it when they looked at the functionality and decided it wasn't worth it? Was it that they decided something else was better? Did they leave for EC2? Did they perhaps you know, go somewhere else and leave, you know, completely off platform? And the point is, depending on that answer, you do different things. And understanding intention is way more important, or at least as important, let me just, you know, as understanding what actually occurred. Because that is what gives you the ability to influence the future, right? Interestingly, this, uh, this data set is about 10, 100 times larger than the transaction data that occurs. Like just, you know, so Amazon happens to run its uh, data warehouse on Redshift, at least in part. And, you know, so we, ha we generated a ton of transactions this last year. Uh, we generated a lot more clickstream data, an awful lot more. And it becomes very interesting for us to understand how do I make offers that are interesting to people? How do we help people find the things that they're looking for? How do we simplify that experience? Now, we've been collecting clickstream data for a long time, but it's big. It's hard to analyze. And, uh, you know, I find company after company after company that I talk to, they collect it, they don't analyze it because it's too hard. And so, you know, this is uh, something that we really, you know, I, th I would encourage you guys to look at as a next step in sort of your analytics journey. Past that, then the question is, how do I categorize customer behavior? So I was on a plane a little while ago to uh, you know, going over the Pacific Ocean. Um, sitting next to me was a teenager. Sitting next to her was um, um, an elderly lady. You know, we are very focused in on the screen in front of us. We have nothing else to do for the next 10 hours. We all have the same exact screen. Now, how does that make any sense? You know, we have, you know, the, the airline knows my age, my gender, my, where I'm flying from, where I'm flying to, what, you know, my uh, nationality of origin is. They have a lot of information that they can combine with what other people like me did yesterday, the month before, the year before, and make it easy for me to find the things that are relevant. And you know, I would emphasize that this isn't really just about revenue and so forth. It's about improving people's experiences, saving them time, getting them what they want, and making that uh, just an overall simpler experience, more you know, delightful experience reduce all of the friction that's necessary to learn how to operate something by just putting the answer in front of them in the first place. The last step of this journey is, is that each customer is unique. Yeah? So on that same plane journey, one of us is traveling to a funeral. Another one is traveling to their first grandchild getting born. 
a third is traveling to a job offer or a job interview. How does that change the experience? How do I understand these things? Well, all of us are publishing our desires, our intentions, our you know, likes out onto the social media web, right? Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter. You know, you, they're retargeting cookies on pretty much every site you might visit. And how do I collect that information to get to a one-to-one -one experience at scale? How do you treat people the way you would treat them if they were your only customer, despite the fact that you have millions of them and have become successful? So I'm going to, and that basically you know, comes down to taking, uh, using social media uh, as a mechanism to add in. And each of these steps along this journey is actually gr growing the amount of data that you're working with, maybe by an order of magnitude. Um, so I'm going to go fast and just close with an anecdote. This has nothing to do with AWS. This has nothing to do with Redshift. I'm going to kind of anonymize it as well. A couple of weeks ago, I was uh, talking with a company, and um, it was a um, large uh, hotel chain, uh, high-end hotel chain. And they had just gotten into the process of using the tw Twitter fire hose as a way of understanding the, um, you know, what people are broadcasting about themselves as a, something that they use to optimize their customer experience because you know, this hotel uh, actually cares quite a bit about you know, making, you know, delightful, generating delightful customer experiences. So they happened to notice that this lady was going to check in and she had uh, tweeted about how she liked dark chocolate. So in the turn down service, they uh, you know, put a square of dark chocolate on her uh, bed. Nice, you, that's, uh, you know, kind of cool. A couple of weeks later, the CEO gets this letter. And uh, it turns out that she had checked in that day to commit suicide. And, you know, that sounds strange, but apparently it's not that uncommon at hotels because people go there because they know they'll be found, they know, you know, they don't really want to interfere with their family members, et cetera. Okay? Um, she saw the square of chocolate. She realized people care about her. She decided to give them another try for at least a little while longer. So the point is really that data has power. We would all go out of our way to do things for people if we know about them. As individuals, we do that every day. The question really comes down to how to do it at scale. The technologies now exist. The data sets now exist. People broadcast the information about themselves. You know, at scale, across other communities, you can learn a lot about people. And the question becomes, how do you use that? Not just to make more money, but to make people's experiences better, to delight them, to inform them, to educate them. No. So that's uh, really, uh, from my perspective, where you guys should be looking at in terms of where you take your products over time, uh, over analytics. Okay. Thank you very much.